connections. Um, I just want to welcome everyone to this is kind of a last minute event, but um, we're kind of taking advantage of the fact that there are um, a lot of crossbills around and they're breeding and they're being found all around the state. So um, we're trying to put together this could could be our best chance to to confirm cross bills for the atlas so um so yeah so we're trying to get as much information out there as possible to help you guys um help you find them and put them on the atlas map um so we have our local resident expert matt young with the finch research network um who's going to talk to us a bit tonight um and i'll jump in here and there as well but for the most part, I'm going to let Matt take the lead. And so we've put together um, a presentation and um, and then we'll have uh, time for questions afterwards. Is that good, Matt, or did you want questions throughout? Uh, yeah, we can do it mostly afterwards, I guess. I mean, if, if there's yeah. something really, if questions are building up in the chat, I mean, I guess people could put them in the chat. Yeah, put them in the chat if you... Um, don't want to forget your questions and I'll, I'll, I'll monitor the chat. Um, and then there are a couple sections, well, actually just, I guess, a couple of slides where we have a little bit of a quiz in the middle too. So feel free to unmute yourselves at that time. I'm going to mute everyone um, now, but um, uh, feel free to, to unmute yourselves for the, the quiz part. Okay. All right. Take it away, Matt. Take it away. So mm -hmm. thank you for uh, letting me do this uh, with you, Julie. It's always an honor to talk uh, finches with anybody out there, as everybody knows. A lot of you do know my name, I guess, over the years, and I've been out in the field with some of you. Um, and I was out in the field uh, this past weekend. Uh, well, I guess it was Friday. We were out in the Adirondacks, Julie and uh, myself, with a, with a few handful of birders, just kind of trying to do some in-the-field training. Unfortunately, we had a snowstorm on Sunday or Saturday, I guess it was, um, and I couldn't stay an extra day. But as Julie said, this is the chance to get crossbills, as you know, you know, and a lot of times people don't realize, some people don't even realize that they breed in the middle of winter with two, three feet of snow on the ground. So this is the chance to get them. White wing crossbill in the photo there, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, I love my red crossbill, but that is the prettiest crossbill on the planet right there. Um, so bird ID, everybody kind of knows this. We don't need to too much go over this, but you know, red crossbill often tends to be, the males tend to be an orangey red. Um, the adult males, uh, white wings, it's uh, more of a pinkish red and siskins, you know, the males tend to have the, the yellowest in the wing. Uh, one thing I might as well say now, and we didn't really put this in there. Um, we were in the field, uh, this past week on Friday, when we were just driving out of uh, Long Lake, we came across a, a male. We thought it was a female at first, actually, um, but we ended up having this bird uh, fly up to the top of the tree and start singing regularly. And we all noticed how yellow it was. Uh, one thing to really keep in mind with Red Cross Bills, you can come across uh, very yellow uh, males. Um, the biggest way of telling them apart, uh, the yellow males from females, is the males will have yellow on the throat. So do keep that in mind. Um, we didn't actually put a slide in here, but uh, yeah, keep that in mind. You can have very yellow males that you think are females. And females can rarely sing, um, but keep in mind, look at that throat area if you can get a good look um, at it. Uh, you know, red crossbill much more flexible and is in the, in the uh, kind of the number of trees it can use for breeding. Um, breeds in two main cycles. A lot of people say, you know, you often see in the literature it can breed any time of year. It doesn't seem to really happen in North America. Uh, mainly breeds in two cycles. Uh, one is uh, January, April, which is what we're in now, and it's utilizing mainly the remaining cone crops left over that developed last summer. And then July to early September is when it's utilizing those newly developed grown crops. So uh, yeah, le learn, learn the calls with Red Cross Bills, as a lot of you know, or have heard me talk over the years, there's multiple call types and they seem to act 
kind of as good biological species in some ways. I don't necessarily think they will ever be split out in the full species, but that remains to be seen. Uh, pay attention to road roads for gridding for any of these. As, as Cindy said earlier, there's been that huge flock down at Paseco uh, gridding on roads upwards of, I think, over 50 birds at a time. Uh, I know Julie and, and uh, I and the rest of us came across a pretty nice flock on Tahawas Road. Uh, I think we had maybe upwards of 15 birds. Um, here's the atlas, uh, the last the comparison of the last three atlases. Um, as you can see, the Adirondacks and kind of the, this area that is known by Central New York locals as the Southern Islands tends to be, the, um, that is the, the area down here in Onondaga and Madison, Shenango counties and Cortland counties. Uh, that was all old planted CCC plantations, a lot of that. So Red Cross Bill in particular can use quite a bit of the non-native Norway spruce. And you can see from Atlas to Atlas, uh, they're very similar areas. Uh, not many Red Cross Bills last Atlas um, in the Adirondacks, which was interesting. You know, the amazing thing is that 2001 White Wing Crossbill event, uh, it was hard to come up, hard to find a Red Cross Bill that year. Um, but anyway, as you can see, Adirondack Southern Highlands, Rensselaer Plateau, Allegheny Plateau are the areas most commonly you can find a Red Cross Bill uh, and you should look for them breeding. Here are some of the sounds or vocalizations, I should say, that Red Cross Bill makes. Um, come on. Hopefully people can hear that. It's kind of, well, let's see here. Is it gonna play? There we go. Kind of soft this recording, but flight call and song in there. Kind of some song phrases there. Um, Red... So Red, Red Crossbill kind of has a weaker sounding song to White Wing Crossbill as, all, as anybody has spent any time in the field uh, this past uh, few months here. Uh, Red Crossbill tends to kind of mix in song phrases with call notes, not nearly as loud. Um, uh, we had a discussion in the field the other day. That, that's largely due to red crossbills have a very small testes uh, compared to white wing crossbills, believe it or not. White wing crossbills have a much louder song. Uh, here's uh, type one flight calls and tube calls. Those are the tubes. Those lower pitch sounds are tubes. So type one flight call is very dry, kind of with a slight uptick and a downward, it's mainly a downward uh, um, sounding, it's, you can see on the spectrograph here, uh, it's kind of a downward cascading sound. Um, the song, here's another song, really nice one. Kind of sounds like there's a lot of flight calls mixed in there. I get a lot of recordings from people that think they're flight calls and they'll mix in flight calls in the song and you can't reliably identify those flight call those flight calls that are in the song. Uh, I should mention the toops are given as excitement calls. Often it's like if there's a predator around, but they'll often give tube calls also when females are getting on nest and 
the males and the females are going back and forth. Here's the, the call that a lot of you are going to want to kind of get down when you hear it. You know, Red Cross Bill in particular gives this very distinctive chitu call, and all of the call types give, from what I can tell, all of them give the same chitu call. They do not vary based on call type. So if it's doing kind of chit, 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 and then chit, to chit, to uh, a lot of times the birds will give a little bit of a flutter, uh, begging to the parents, a uh, wing flutter to them and with their mouth open. Um, always really good to look for. I suspect that will pick up here as we move forward. I, I know there's been at least uh, a couple fledglings seen in the past week uh, in the Adirondacks in two different locations. And I think the bulk of them will come in from about April 1st uh, into the first uh, week or so of May. White wing crossbill, uh, they can actually nest a little bit longer in the fall than red crossbills. Red crossbills seem to shut, at least in North America, they seem to shut down breeding when they start molting, which is right in the middle of September, basically. Um, but you're gonna wanna look for heavy cone crops you know, one of the things is this year, we had one of the better cone crops we've had. Uh, last year, we didn't have a great cone crop in the Adirondacks, but you know, we're, we're on a run here in New York State of some really good cone crops over the last, uh, I'm gonna say since about 2017, we've had three really big cone crops. And uh, we've had really good numbers of red cross bills breeding in the state and some white wings as well. Um, Lightweight crossbill, it's interesting, you know, there was a, there was a huge invasion in 84, 85 that uh, was documented. Uh, and there was apparently a lot of white wings even singing in Norway spruce. I have not seen that myself to be something that white wings will key in on. Uh, they'll certainly feed in Norway spruce. I have not seen them pull off nesting uh, in Norway spruce myself, but that 84, 85 winter was well documented. You can see in the 2000, 2005 uh, event, um, I actually got the white wing crossbills, I think in all those blocks south of the Adirondacks, uh, and they were all in white spruce plantations. Um, but you can see there was a massive eruption in the Adirondacks in uh, breeding event in uh, 2001 it was. Uh, this event, uh, it's the second best white wing crossbill year I've seen in New York in the 20, 25 years, uh, at least from a breeding perspective that I've seen in New York since I've been doing this since the late 90s. Um, it's nowhere near in comparison to that 2001 uh, winter, though. That was an unbelievable. It was, you could, you know, you had white wing crossbill singing from the treetops. Um, if there was like five spruce trees in, a, in an area. It was pretty amazing. They were utilizing a lot of red spruce that year, which is not a species that they often use, but they will use it when there's a good cone crop. But you can see Adirondack Southern Islands, Rensselaer Plateau, you can see this is a few uh, dots over here. I was out with Paul O'Connor in 2001. I grew up near Troy, so I was, I grew up uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes from Grafton, which is that Rensselaer Plateau area. There's a, there's a nice uh, kind of small pocket of boreal habitat over there of spruce and fir. <clears throat> Here's uh, vocalizations of white wing. So again, they'll give this call when there's a predator around, but also when they're on nests. So always key into that. These are kind of the, the you know, equivalent, the two calls are the same as excitement calls. And always key in on that. If you, if you hear that, it's definitely worth going back and putting a little more effort in uh, as far as, uh, you know, 
trying to confirm them breeding because there's a very good chance that there's a nest in that area. Um, here's a variety of I love that pink call that they make, the nasally sound. Uh, not heard that often, right there. Almost sounds like uh, a little bit like a goldfinch, not the main flight call, but the nasally sound. Right there. A lot of people don't know that vocalization for white wing. And then the song, Matt Mellor, I was actually with Matt Mellor when he recorded these birds. Uh, oh, uh, went past it. Let's see here. Much more powerful. Really carries. Uh, when you hear them singing, uh, they act, White Wing Crossbill was suspected breeding in New York State for several decades, but I, I don't think it was actually confirmed until the seventies. I think Peterson might have been the one that actually confirmed them on the Chubb River in the seventies, uh, and then they were, you know, obviously found during the first atlas. And have been confirmed every atlas. Uh, even this year, there's I think there's three uh, three blocks they've been confirmed in already. Pine siskin, you know, it's an interesting pine siskin. Is kind of in between. You know, I always call. I always I always tell people when I give presentations and talk finches. You know, it's the generalist of the finch group. Um, in fact, I'm working on a paper with uh, a researcher at University of Wisconsin and. There's pretty good evidence that all of the Eastern finches are really in decline, particularly the eruptive ones, except for pine siskin and, and red crossbill, believe it or not. White wings are in decline, and as are the other uh, Eastern finches. But pine siskin is flexible in its breeding. A lot of people didn't don't realize that they can actually breed as early as early to mid-March. They can start building a nest, utilizing last year's cone crop, if it's a good cone crop. Um, you know, and then they'll they'll move on and breed somewhere else, utilizing sometimes like you know weed seeds in the in the uh, tundra to the north of us. But you know they're they're really kind of part uh, you know crossbill, and they'll feed on 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 seed uh, seeds and conifers. They're they're part part uh, red pole, and that they'll feed on red pole on uh, catkins, and also seed like uh, part goldfinch. They'll feed on seeds. And they also like spruce budworms. So population numbers seem to be up on this particular bird. But they're, you right now, you want to look for mainly, uh, you know, you want to look for remaining spruce crops with all of these species um, right now. Um, Siskin, though, will utilize hemlock for breeding more than any of the other, three, other two species. Uh, so there is a huge hemlock crop in the Adirondacks and across the whole state right now, actually. So, you know, if you are driving by an area and you don't see spruces, you see a lot of hemlock, give it a, give it a look um, because there could be siskin breeding in hemlock. So there's the map, uh, again, pretty flexible. They'll even rarely or occasionally breed around feeder stations. So it's similar, you wanna look for similar habitat as crossbills but can be statewide in conifers and occasionally even near uh, feeder stations. I know, uh, I think it was Jay McGowan actually had him uh, begging young at his feeder last uh, summer. But you can see again, Southern Highlands, Adirondacks are the main areas, uh, Allegheny Plateau and the Rensselaer Plateau as well. <laughs> A lot of people don't realize this. So, catalog number one six three two two three. So the first calls there are the flight calls they often give, 
the zipper call they can give in a in a you know perched or in flight to some degree. It is not their song though, the zipper call. Um, so flight calls, zipper call. Flight call. The other calls are kind of chatter calls. Flight calls again, and that's the, you know the the photo there. It's it's uh, that's a uh, siskin feeding on what looks like alder cactus. So again, red poles foul alder crops. Uh, here's a song. They're really great imitators of other birds. Not the best recording in the world, but. Gave a little bit of a raptor call there or something. Then it's re. They can do a lot of they can they can mimic a lot of different other birds when they're singing. Often they'll give tut tut robin calls. They'll put in evening grosbeak calls. I've even heard them put in like uh, shorebirds from the boreal forest. Um, a lot of different. They'll just run through them. So it's they can kind of throw you off if you're not cued in. But they're just giving like little snippets of them. So that's that's what kind of keys you in to that they're you know it's a siskin not the actual bird. Um, these are just bird ID resources that we threw in here. Obviously, Macaulay Library for photos and sounds, all about birds, photo sounds, behaviors. Peterson Field Guide, the Peeplo Guide, which is also at, uh, it's a, a bird, bird academy uh, URL, I believe. Uh, this is a piece on crossbills that Tim Sparr and I wrote in 2017 that we need to update. I know there's Atlas species accounts you could read as well. And then obviously Finch Research Network, we have a ton of information up as well. <clears throat> Here's, uh, I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice a little bit. Had some allergies going on and possibly a sinus thing. But uh, so we just wanted to cover tree species, which is really what drives this whole dynamic. Um, and, you know, I always do these cone assessments every year. And that's how I usually can tell you know, what crossbills are going to do when we put out the, the finch, uh, finch forecast every year. For the last 10, 15 years, I'm the one that's done the crossbill piece of that forecast, obviously with Ron and Tyler as well. Um, Julie put this really nice schematic together, uh, kind of color coding what species uses what trees here. That's a red spruce. It's uh, kind of more of a yellow green look to it and more spreading in profile. So, so here are the spruces. And if you look at red spruce is kind of the yellow green one, white spruce is the one that can be most easily confused with balsam fir. Um, and it also can be somewhat confused with black spruce. Black spruce, so white spruce, I always say, is more blue green in good lighting, and red spruce is more yellow green in good lighting. Red spruce is more spreading. White spruce is more kind of, uh, you know, vertical and and more compact. It's not as spreading, not as wide in its width. Uh, black spruce always, um, you know, often looks kind of sickly in some ways. It grows. It's the it's the spruce of bogs whereas red spruce tends to grow around the rims of bogs. Uh, white spruce tends to be, um, at least in the Adirondacks, it's, it's, not, it's the least common of the three spruces, believe it or not, in the Adirondacks. It's the true boreal, transcontinental boreal species. But black spruce looks like, everybody knows like the Lorax, it looks like a truffle tree. I mean, it always has this like, often has this little 
kind of like uh, you know clumping at the top of the tree where it looks like it's almost the the densest or the thickest or the healthiest. Um, and you can see on red spruce, all three of them are going to use red spruce, red crossbill, white white wing crossbill, and siskin will use red spruce and white spruce. Uh, white spruce is probably the preferred uh, spruce for all of these finches. It is, as Jeff Groff once told me, he's the guy that, that described, originally described the uh, call types, the red crossbill call types. It's the favorite crossbill munchie uh, for all crossbills. And siskins will use it as well. It's the most pliable of all of the spruces. The scales of the cones are most pliable on white spruce. Then red spruce. Black spruce is actually semi serotonous in that there's a gelatinous kind of coating on the cones. And they're somewhat, they're semi serotonous in that some of the cones on the trees can actually be kind of encased in this and some aren't and it's kind of driven by heat. Um, so black spruce, you know, if you start at the beginning of the year, red crossbills and white wings will be in white spruce first. Um, and then the bumper cone crop years uh, and the spruces all tend to somewhat synchronize their, their cone crops. Uh, the soft cone conifers tend to synchronize their cone crops, actually. Um, compared to the pines, uh, they tend to alternate years. Um, but white spruce is the favorite for all three of them, most pliable scales, then red spruce. And one thing everybody should be looking for is, and this is partly why we're finding white wings in the, in the densest pockets uh, in boreal habitat, is they like those bogs where black spruce grows in the white or the red spruce tends to rim the bog. Um, and black spruce holds their seeds the longest because of that kind of semi serotonous kind of condition that they have. So that's what white spruce will key in on. And people should look if there's any late nesters uh, for white wing crossbills, they'll be in those black spruce bogs. Um, but again, profile wise, it looks kind of like a truffle tree. Now, Norway spruce, very, very spreading. Uh, the branches look almost droopy. The cones are, I don't know, five, six times the size of our, our native cones. And you can see the cones here. Uh, black spruce tends to be very round. Red spruce intermediate between uh, white spruce and black spruce. So black spruce the roundest, red spruce almost more uh, I don't know, oblong, and white spruce is a little bit longer. Uh, Eastern hemlock, again, red crossbills will use them, particularly type three, which is the smallest billed bird. It's the one we get in the hugest or the largest eruptions in the east. Uh, they, they do these big pendulum swings like white wings do. Uh, they'll go from the western, western hemlock forest in uh, Pacific Northwest, and they'll move in, in, in the Adirondacks some years in big numbers. They were very, very common in 2017, 2018. And in fact, I actually confirmed them breeding in the Adirondacks that year. So, but very small cone. Siskins love hemlock. Um, balsam fir is not really that utilized because the cones to hiss and fall apart. They, they form and then they just fall apart. Um, and it also has the most linear, uh, it almost looks like a toothpick when you see balsam fir out in the swamp. Um, and people might not realize that the cones actually grow upwards where all your other conifers, the cones grow downwards. Uh, in the true firs, the cones grow up and you'll see these, if you look at the top of a, a balsam fir, you'll see these little spikes sticking up. That used to be where the cone was. But the cones to his fall apart and all that's left is that kind of spike sticking up. Uh, tamaracks are deciduous conifer. Uh, white wing crossbills love tamaracks. So they really key in on white spruce uh, and tamarack that begin the cone cycle year, which is about July 1. When, when cone crops form and they start to ripen, white wing crossbills are wandering the country looking for the best white spruce in tamarack cone crops. Um, 
I was kind of surprised a few years ago, this, this Northeastern type 10 Red Cross bill was readily using Tamarack, a really big Tamarack cone crop in 2017, 2018. And it was actually utilizing it and breeding in it. Um, so it was pretty, pretty interesting. As you can see, you know, Eastern Hemlock always look for that leader branch tips over. Uh, balsam fir can often look like a toothpick at the top. Tamarack gets golden in the fall. Uh, it's a deciduous conifer in that it drops its needles. And then the pines, largely the, so there's two kinds of pines. There's a white pine group and a red pine group. The white pine group is semi-soft. So when I talk about soft and hard cone conifers, what I'm talking about there is the soft cone conifers are the tree species where the cone crop develops and ripens immediately. Um, and that's basically your hemlock, your tamarack, and your three spruces. Um, and white pine is a semi soft in that it, it holds its seed longer and the scales are harder than a spruce, but they're not as hard as a red pine or a pitch pine. If you ever pick up a red pine cone, if you were to throw them at somebody, and I do not advise that, um, they basically, you know, would hurt. But so red cross bills really love to utilize the pines. They're much more flexible in their diet than white wing cross bills. That's because they have a stronger musculature to their jaw and they could utilize a lot more, a uh, larger variety of, of conifers. And, and as you get from the beginning of the cone cycle year, which is July 1, those soft cone conifers will drop their seed first. Now, when, as you get further away from the development of that cone crop, food gets more and more limited. And it's these hard pines, the red pines, the pitch pine, the jack pine, the Scots pine, that will actually hold the seed the longest and will get cross bills through the time of the year that food is most limited. So from like March, April, May, uh, and then they are off and running again, looking for those newly developed cone crops come late May, early June. So red cross bills love red pine and pitch pine. Um, Siskin will utilize white pine a little bit because it's a semi-soft. Siskin really can't utilize, can't like pry open a scale on a conifer cone, like a cross bill tech. So there's jack pine, Scots pine, um, red cross bill will utilize those. Again, those are hard pines. Uh, Siskins do love northern white cedar though, and they will utilize it for nesting as well. So you can see kind of the, the, the cones there. So we have a little bit of a tree quiz here. How do you want to handle this, uh, Julie? And we didn't really, we want to give people a chance? Yeah, I think so. I think that's kind of the fun part. Yeah. <laughs> but I, um, there is one, one quick question from Tom first about um, how late do you expect to find white winged crossbills using the blue black spruce this year? Well, they'll utilize that between March, April, and May. Yeah. So they're, they're probably, they're in it now because they're in, you know, that's where you can kind of find in these densest, the densest spots for white wing crossbills right now are either areas with white spruce that had great cone crops or the boreal box. So Sabatis is great for white wing crossbills. In fact, it's often one of the best places for white wing crossbills every year that we get them. Um, but yeah, they'll be in between now and, and May when those newly developed white spruce crops start to form, uh, white wing crossbills will be in uh, black spruce because the white spruce will largely have dropped its seed, but the black spruce will hold its seed because of that kind of semi serotonous kind of state. And what I mean by serotonous, again, it's kind of, a, it, you know, has a gelatinous like shellacking almost around the cone that keeps the seed in. And it, it only is over uh, through heat or fire, like extreme high temperatures or fire um, that opens those scales so the white wing crossbills can get at it. Um, 
So anybody want to take a stab at what the first tree is there on the left? Please speak up. Uh, tamarack slash larch. Tamarack. Yep. Exactly. What about the middle one? Truffula. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so black spruce. You can see the classic profile there. Now, not every black spruce has that profile. But again, look for bogs. Look for round cones, very round cones. Um, that's where you're going to find black spruce. What about the, the 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 one on the right? That's two different pines. It looks like to me. A red. Yep. And red. yep. Yeah. Red on the left, white on the right. So classic profile. You know, white is more kind of spacing and more. You know, it's kind of spreading. White is, red is more compact. There it is, red eastern white pine. So was this a quiz too? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the right. three, three different species. All right, three different species. Who wants to take a stab at it? Well, hemlock on the right. Why yeah. is that? The top you can see is is kind of bending over. Yep. And the left one. This one looks like a balsam fir. Yeah. yeah, it's probably the toughest one out of them. But you're right. There we go. So I I, I already I cheated. I, I hit the I hit the thing already. But <laughs> red spruce is the middle one. So white spruce can be the one that's most easily confused with balsam. Um, red spruce is more intermediate, and then. Eastern hemlock on the right there. I don't know if we have any more of the quizzes, but it's one more. Yeah, we do. Yep, we do. What about here? It's probably a red spruce. They pop up one at a time on this one, right, Julie? Yes. All right. I'll give you bonus uh, points for the middle one if you can identify the trees in the background too. <laughs> <laughs> those are white pines in the background i nope. think no okay uh, spruce no i mean that's actually a really good yeah. guess though i mean that there's only two that i would have guessed two species uh at a distance when they're that tall and spreading and dominant but what's the tree on the left anybody want to take a guess at it a red spruce it's a red spruce now it's interesting because it has a little bit, kind of a bluish green look to it, but it's more spreading than a white spruce. Mm -hmm. So it's a red spruce. Uh, what about the middle tree, the one that's in the foreground? I'm guessing an old balsam. That's a balsam, yep, that's a balsam. What about the one on the, uh, what about the one on the right? I'm not. Yep, hemlock. Not not a great example, but kind of delicate needles in a way has a little bit of a leader branch that's tipping over. Anybody want to take another stab at the at the plant, uh, trees in the background of the balsam? Maybe white spruce. It's all right. It's red spruce. Right, fine. It's oh, red, red spruce. spruce actually. Huh? It's a tough one, but it's yeah, it's red spruce. Mm -hmm. red, red pine, I think, can be a little more compact and not as like, you know, you can kind of tell a spruce because they're more straight out to the sides. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, not an easy ID. Um, Matt, so Glenn asked um, if the, the crossbills will use the, the European large. They Would... will. Yes. I've had red crossbill. Uh, breed in Europe. I've had red crossbill breed in everything. And I should mention, you know, red crossbills will regularly utilize Norway spruce for breeding. Um, and they're doing it right now. Um, it's a massive cone crop. But white wings, I have not witnessed that myself. But clearly, in that 1984-85 event in the state, uh, there was a well-documented, it seemed like they were singing in, in Norway spruce. So, but they'll use, you know, red crossbill will use European larch or the Japanese larch, larch that is out there too. Um, 
much bigger cone than our American uh, larch or tamarack. Um, but yeah, they'll utilize it for sure. Um, it'll be interesting to see. Or do you have some of that in your area? Yes. Yeah. 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 It's worth checking. I mean, larch, like the European. See, the, here's the interesting thing about European larch and Norway spruce. They almost act like a hard pine in that they're well, they're not native to this country, obviously, or this continent, obviously. The Norway spruce cones are so much bigger than the native spruces, and the European larch has a much bigger cone than our native larches, particularly our Eastern uh, tamarack, um, that those cones are so big and they're harder that they'll actually hold the seed longer um, through this time of the year, actually, particularly in the largest uh, kind of, you know, best cone crop years. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would keep an eye out for that. Um, but, you know, for the most part, you're gonna be looking for white wings and, and whatever is left in that red spruce uh, cone crop that was great this past year. Here's a tree, uh, I, took, I took this photograph. Actually, I took this the day we were out on the Red Slope Plateau, Julie. Um, and you can see there are cones going down at least two thirds of the tree. Yeah. Um, it's, and I would call this a great cone crop. Um, on that red spruce there. So whatever is remaining in the red spruce, that is gonna be the main player for all three of these species actually. But that red spruce will be dropping its seed and it's gonna basically, once we get these warm days and it's gonna be warm all this upcoming week, all the red spruce is, a lot of it's gonna drop its seed and you're gonna see white wings really, really key in on black spruce. And you could see red crossbill switch to red pine here soon because they hold their seed consistently the longest into the year and the seed is most readily available during the lean time of the year for food. So um, hopefully it doesn't warm up too much because we want all these crossbills to be able to produce uh, babies. Um, and hopefully we'll be seeing lots of streaky, fle uh, streaky fledglings soon. So yeah, that was Eastern Hemlock on the right. So there's a there's a red spruce stand, and you just massive cone crop. I mean, this is, I mean, just ridiculous. I don't think I've ever seen trees that heavy. Uh, there was a large crop a few years ago that was unbelievable. Oh, I should shouldn't say that. In the 2001 year, when we had all those white wings, the red spruce was just enormous. The cone crop. <laughs> so when you assess a cone crop, and I'm going to be actually. I'm looking into actually, we're writing a grant, the Finch Research Network, we're writing a grant. We're gonna be doing a, a train a trainers workshop at Acadia National Park, hopefully in July of 2023, where we'll be going over ID of finches, habitat ID, tree ID, assess a cone crop actually, and then you can become part of the next wave of Finch forecasters, become part of the Finch Forecasting Network. We want to really expand the, thing, the number of people that give us cone crop data. So when you come, when it gets to assessing cone crops, there's a few big things you wanna look at is how many trees have cones, how much of the tree has cones and how dense are the cones. And it's kind of hard to do it across species, but we've tried to come up with some methods um, and I'm still gonna tweak these because I think I almost think you got to do them differently for the soft cone conifers, uh, the larger uh, uh, cone trees, like the spruces compared to hemlocks. Then you got to do the hard pines because they're a whole different ball of wax. Um, and then you got the semi soft ones uh, like white pine, which tends to have a cone the size of like a Norway spruce cone. So. You know, we're still we're still like updating this and tweaking it, but this gives you a rough idea of how I've been scoring uh, cone crops over the last 20 years. Uh, you always kind of want to just look at one side. You can kind of do it pretty quickly too. Um, just look at it. Usually need binoculars though. Uh, look at it, see how many cones are on the top. They always form from top down. They don't, you know, you'll never see a cones at the bottom and not at the top unless the squirrel took all the cones off the top. 
that does happen. Um, so as you can see here, scores vary based on tree species for hard cone pines, red cones based on age and openness. So this is a pitch pine uh, tree here. You can see these kind of more brown or grayer cones are the older cones. And then the redder ones are the newer ones. And you can actually see here at the very, very distal end, the cone, the scales are starting to open up a little bit on that. So, you know, when Red Cross bills, particularly this is the Northeastern bird, will utilize pitch pine because it holds its seed through the times of the year when food is most leanest, is the lean, at its lowest. So pitch pine, jack pine, red pine, are all hold, hold seed through that time of the year. Norway spruce is an outlier there though, when it comes to spruces, just because it's non-native. So, but we're, we're working on assessing and, and kind of dialing this in even more. Here's the call types you're gonna be looking at in New York. So please record them. Everybody knows, I mean, a lot of you out there, you can make a phone recording with your, uh, with your phone. You can make a recording with your phone. I know the Chapmans have been sending me really good professional grade kind of recordings. I appreciate it. Um, but you can get recordings with your phone uh, that are identifiable to call type. Four main breeding types in New York, type one, and I need to update these maps really to show it better. Most common in the Southern part of New York, up until this past year, like right now, it's still the most common. But over the last 20 years, it was almost it's this like dividing line south of the Adirondacks, south of the thruway. I found type ones north of the thruway in the Adirondacks. I found this eastern or northeastern type 10, which we are working on describing it as a new call type. Um, it is not the same bird as that is found in the Sitka spruce forest out west. Um, type three is the one that will come in in really big numbers in eruptive years. Uh, it will nest utilizing hemlock and spruces, but it really has a hard time utilizing pines compared to the other uh, crossbow fall types in the state. Um, it's interesting when I look at this, it's like type one loves Norway spruce and it will utilize white pine a lot as well. Um, type three loves the spruces and hemlocks. Type two and 10 will also use red pine regularly. Um, and so they do differentiate in their diet. So, um, so core zone of occurrence is where each call type is most common and is most associated with those conifers in that particular area. Um, so you can see the Western type three is most common out West. It bred in the Adirondacks in 2017, 2018. And I've actually confirmed all four of these uh, types uh, breeding in New York state. But again, it's type one and type 10 is the most common uh, of these four by far. We do every once in a great while get type four, type five, you know, in singles pretty much or very small numbers from year to year. I know, I think, Chapman's, I think you've sent me at least three of these call types, maybe all four. Is that right? You're on mute. I know you've had two, uh, three. Yeah, I, have, I haven't actually kept track very well. I, I get the thing back and I just and I, uh, enter it. Yeah. Enter it at yeah. The I think you've had two, three, and 10, but maybe not one. You seem to be an area of the state that gets type two more than most areas in New York. So here, I'll just play the common ones here. The ones that will breed. So very dry, there's a two ball in there too. Type 10, you know, which is an up sweep followed by a down sweep. Type 3, kind of squeaky sounding to me. 
It's kind of a zigzag. It's a down, up, down. You know, and the interesting thing about type threes is when they do erupt in big numbers, uh, they can outnumber our, our ones that we have year after year after year. Um, type two is the, you know, around every year in very small numbers, more common out west in, in the Ponderosa Pines. A little lower pitch than type one. So please record them, you know, the, the most common species in the Macaulay Library collection is Red Crossville by 35%. Um, I believe it's approaching somewhere around 13 or 14,000 recordings of Red Crossville, believe it or not. So, you know, you can go to the Atlas website there uh, for how to record. It's kind of really put this together. It's a lot of uh, bits of information from Macaulay and eBird on how to best take a recording. Uh, try to use, if you do use your smartphone, try to find an app that does wave files, uh, upload it, and then you can process it with free software. Um, but please do upload it to uh, eBird. It's easier for me. It's easier for me to. Uh, Sorry, my mom was trying to call me there. Um, it is easier for me to identify them if you put them in the eBird. Um, I can see the spectrogram. And just send me an email. So when it comes to looking for cross bills right now, you know, by all means, uh, I'm finding them all through Southern New York. Uh, they're much greater numbers in, in the Adirondacks. Um, but uh, the... Uh, uh, in the southern parts of the state, you can find them in Norway spruce plantations right now. Um, in the in the northern parts, you're going to look for red spruce, uh, but they could very well switch to red pine soon. Um, let me see here. I think I went. Yeah, so look for gritting birds. Um, spruce is the thing to key in on right now. Um, stop. You know, you can stop and play White Wing Crossbill if you play the Merlin uh, song. They all three of the species will respond to it, um, and it can help with as far as finding them because we're not going to have birds around in these numbers every single year of the atlas. So you got to kind of get crossbills and siskins uh, when it's kind of hot, and siskins will start the nest here soon, and they can nest all the way into July. So you know when they when they show up in years like this. You know, you want to look for good cone crops, uh, red cross bills, all of them will break out into smaller groups. Uh, red cross bill pine siskins, though, will often be in twos and threes, uh, like as far as two, three pairs. White wings will pack in more, and you can sometimes find five to ten different pairs together uh, in a bog in a small area. Uh, look for pair bonding, uh, cross bills, and to a lesser degree siskins. It's, it's advantageous for crossbills to form pair bonds within social flocks. So, because they're quite flexible in breeding. So when they do find the, the really good cone crop, they can go right into breeding pretty much. They can start doing some singing, a little bit of courting, and they go right into breeding. And we're in a period right now, I think, where song is diminished and they're actually, a lot of the females are on nests. And uh, when you're finding flocks gridding, I'd say, I don't know, 75 to 80% of the birds are, are males right now. Um, so you want to key into that, which again, gives you some idea that very likely all these females are on nests. Um, they'll do these courtship songs, you know, they'll break out into groups. You know, the interesting thing about finches is they sing this kind of pre-breeding conversational song where they kind of is more open-ended. When they break out into the smaller groups, two pairs, three pairs, they'll sing a more stereotype rep rep repetitious song over and over and over. Um, <clears throat> when you do find them at com uh, communal gridding or drinking sites, you know, look to see if there's 
uh, pairs within those communal, at those communal gridding and drinking sites. Because sometimes you can kind of get pair information for the atlas if you have birds following each other, if you have males and females, you'll see sometimes when we were in the, the Adirondacks uh, last Friday, we had a male, we came along a, a male and female red on Howes Road, and the male took off, but it went up to the top of a tree roadside and was watching the female. And then it came back down again next to the female and then went back up to the tree again. And you can get them non-synchronized from area to area. Uh, you can get, you know, uh, in one area where they might be breeding, they might be all quiet now because the females are on nests. But as the population grows and if the cone crop can continue to support it, you know, you can have birds starting to nest in new locations and they're singing again. Um, and I would expect, again, as I've said, you'll look for white wings, keying in on black spruce here in the coming months, and red cross bills to possibly be uh, switching to red pine. Uh, and I think most of the juveniles will be seen in uh, April into May. Uh, I'll let you take this piece from here, Julie. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, oops, sorry, you're losing your voice there. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, yeah, so I just have a couple more slides and then we'll go into the open questions. Um, and I, I just wanted to take a few minutes just to talk about how you would code some of the behaviors that you might see or the most likely behaviors that you are to see for these birds. Um, so singing, um, uh, as Matt said, that they there are still some birds singing now. Um, a lot of the singing has died down a bit now that the birds are on nest, um, but they still might um, start up again. Um, and if you, um, I just highly recommend going through Merlin, the Merlin app, um, and it very clearly tells you what's a song versus what's a call in the app. Um, so that's a good way to just test yourself that what you're hearing is actually a song and not a call. Um, if they're singing in flight, um, then that is usually what we call their courtship flight display. Um, so that you would actually code as courtship. So if they're just singing from the top of a tree, um, then you would code it as singing. But if they're singing while flying around, um, then, then it's a courtship. Um, pairs, uh, it's not necessarily going to be any time that you see a male and a female together. Um, it could just kind of be happenstance that those are the two individuals that you're seeing um, that are in a big social flock. Um, so what you're kind of looking for in order to code them as a pair is to see them kind of interacting with each other um, consistently. So you'll want to watch them for a few minutes and see what they're doing, see if they fly together, see if they're um, gritting together, um, and if they're interacting in any way. Um, let's see. Sorry. Um, and then um, for courtship, um, I just wanted to uh, I'll just reiterate that they do this this um, flight display. It's if you're familiar with the the goldfinch, um, American goldfinch does this butterfly flight. So they're kind of fluttering and flying around doing this fluttering while they're doing their song. That's kind of the same thing that you'll see for for the crossbills too. I should add, pine siskins do the same thing actually. They'll do this and very siskins, slow right. kind of flutter flight song as well. Yeah. Um, and then if you change the slide. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, and so threat displays, crossbills tend not to be super aggressive birds compared to a lot of other species. Um, and they aren't, you know, territorial in the traditional sense. So they're not like defending a, a large territory against neighboring birds because they are breeding in close proximity to one another. Um, and so, um, but, but they do guard around their nest sites. Um, and they'll also, the males will also kind of guard their, their mate. Um, so you'll see sometimes like if the female comes down to feed, um, the male will be right there kind of hovering over her, watching her um, and making sure that no other male comes in and, and tries to steal her. 
Um, you will occasionally see some fights, some aggression between individuals, um, but it's it's not very common. But but they it is possible to see that because um, they are fighting over um, good food resources and nest sites and stuff. Um, and then um, Matt mentioned early on the the toop calls or the alarm calls, um, and and that is a sign that they um, feel threatened. And um, if they're doing that towards another crossbill, then you would count that as being a territorial display. If they're doing it towards you or towards another bird species, um, then that would be agitation. Next slide. Um, and then uh, for nest building, um, it is possible to see the birds carrying nesting materials. Both of them, both of the male and female will be carrying nesting materials. Um, the female will be doing most of the, the building though. Um, and then in terms of feeding young, you're not going to be seeing them carrying food because they're gonna carry the seeds and, and stuff in their crop. Um, so you won't you won't be using the carrying food code at all, um, but you may see them um, feeding some of their young birds. Um, so again, if you hear that chitu call, then um, then that means that there is a fledgling around. And if you you can either code that as a fledgling if you see it, or feeding feeding young if you see them feeding. Um, but um, yeah, you're not going to see them carrying carrying actual food. So, all right, I kind of flew through that really quickly, but we have um, a lot more um, detail on those behaviors in those species profiles that I posted in the, um, in the chat. Um, there has been quite a lively chat conversation going on. Um, and I've been trying to answer the questions as we've been going through. Um, there's one question, Matt, that, I, um, that has been posted that I wasn't able to answer. Um, and that was from Tom asking, outside of the Adirondacks, what is the minimum plantation size that you should search for these birds? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, you're not going to find a hedgerow or a very small uh, area. I don't know, like, I don't really know an acreage. All these state lands down near us, Tom, across the Allegheny Plateau, uh, I, the vast majority of those state forests are going to have sizable uh, plantations and large enough that will support breeding uh, across those. In fact, I think you and I actually, one of the years of the Atlas, uh, got out and confirmed some breeding across bills and siskins um, 20 years ago or 15 years ago. But uh, I don't know the acreage, but I know they have cut over some of the state lands down here. Um, down in, I should say down here, but in the southern part of the state, um, and they're smaller. But I haven't seen anything in the state lands that didn't seem sizable enough to support uh, cross bills. The other big thing is, you know, how, how heavy is the cone crop? You know, in the Norway spruce crop in many of the state forests in the southern part of New York is pretty significant this year. It's one of the largest ones I've seen in a while, uh, at least six, seven years, I'd say. So but I don't know the acreage. So any other questions? I see some more messages popping up here. Let's see. Yeah, so Sue just asked, um, and I guess someone else asked this and I missed it. Um, do, do these birds always nest in the trees that they're feeding from, or do they use different types of trees to feed and nest on? Well, they're gonna be foraging in whatever tree has seeds. Uh, as far as uh, feeding young, you often will see that roadside uh, where the, they literally regurgitate into the mouth of the young as they're kind of doing this begging display and with red cross bills, it's very obvious because they give this very distinctive kid to call that we keep talking about. So um, that does, yeah, they might have started nesting in a red spruce because structurally it, it provided more protection. 
they, you know, like a white wing crossbill, but they could be very well feeding in a black spruce that's not far away. Oh, I think that answers the question, right? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to clarify, Paul, Paul got confused when I said, when I had listed the, the courtship flight under singing. And I really, I just had it under there because I wanted to make sure that, um, so they're, they're singing, but if they're singing from a tree, then you would code that as singing. But if they're singing while flying, you would code that as courtship. Um, so it just kind of depends on where they're singing from and the context of that singing, if that makes sense. And then I, I don't, I don't, I haven't seen any videos of the courtship flight. Do you know of any, Matt? I do not. I mean, that's, we saw I mean, it last week. <laughs> we saw it last Friday. <laughs> that doesn't help. I, I, I even saw it in both species too, didn't we? Yeah, we did. I mean, so if you like, to me, it was incredibly reminiscent of the, the goldfinch courtship flight. So if you're familiar with that, which I feel like that's a more common species, then um, then it's it's very similar. Purple um, finches do it too, by the way. Purples I mean, too? Yeah, they're, they're, and I've seen purples. I mean, from a habitat perspective, purples, I've seen it doing the same kind of habitat. They do this kind of flutter, you know, flight song. Um, if you've seen purples do it or goldfinches do it, um, it's the same kind of thing. It could have been this material. If they pulled it off, you know, I have seen, amazingly, I've seen crossbills eating lichens several times over the years. In fact, I've seen almost all of the finches eating lichens over the years. Um, but if it was pulling it off, not eating it and yeah i can very well see that being nest used for the nest hopefully that answers that question jim we need we need somebody to get the video of uh, you know you often don't know when they're going to break into this courtship flight song so it kind of catches you a little bit by surprise yeah i'm looking for a goldfinch flight display and i'm not Find one right off, but I'll let you know if I find it here. <laughs> it's something I should look for for presentation. So, so I'm glad somebody brought it up because it's almost all the finches seem to do it to some degree. Is this chat going to be available for a while to look at? Um, I'll make the chat available with um, with the video recording which I'm going to put up on the, um, the Atlas YouTube channel. Okay. Uh, yeah. It might take me a couple days just because I have to do a little bit of video editing and it takes a while to upload and stuff, but um, um, it should be up soon. I know we packed quite a bit in uh, as far as information. It's, you know, it's, a, it's a bit of an interesting, tricky uh, nesting cycle once you, once you kind of key in on it. Uh, you can you can kind of get it down, um, but yeah, it's you know that that whole you know people for years said how oh, you keep buying crossbills. Well, it's all about knowing what is on the menu at that time of the year. Um, so uh, that's really you know the, the most simplistic way of putting it. You know, know your conifers, and then uh, know how long they kind of roughly hold their seed for. And that's how you can cue in on them every year. So every year I go out and I look in white spruce to start the cone cycle year. And then I switch to red spruce, you know, and then I'll switch to the white pine, you know, and then I'll switch to black pine or black spruce and red pine. You know, and that's how I key in on Norway spruce too, I throw in there all the time because it's just an outlier. It's, it's, you know, there was so much of it planted in the southern part of the state. Yeah, that's Scary County now. Is is Burnt Ross in Scary County, or is that just outside Scary County? I think it is. It's just out. 
somebody needs to do Bart Ross, and it's been on my radar. I don't Mine know. too. <laughs> Brian might do it. Um, it's a fabulous place for Crossville's for Red Crossville and could be White Wing because not only does it have a lot of Norway spruce and European large and Scotch pine and red pine, but also has native red spruce. Because it's kind of at the very northern edge of the, I don't know, some people call it the northern edge of the Catskills, some people call it the edge of the Helderbergs. You get some red spruce that's native, it seems to be native at uh, the Rossman. It is scary, Pound. Yeah. I, I, I'd be surprised if you don't find lots of red cross bills over there if you, do, if, you, if you approached it in a systematic way. The problem is that area, there's a fair number of seasonal roads there, but there is two roads that go up over it. So the other thing I should mention is, you know, for areas that you can't get into right now, um, they should start to open up here in another couple of weeks. So try to get out into areas that haven't been touched yet. Uh, some of these Atlas blocks see you know, hard to get once the, you, know, you won't be able to get to them until the snow melts. But I think we're gonna be, I don't know, it looks like 40 to 60 here degrees for the next week straight. So a lot of that's gonna, a lot of it's gonna melt. Just, we just don't want the seed fall to happen too fast. Uh, you know, you wouldn't expect it there, but it's not impossible. I know, um, I think Mike, Mike, I saw that was on uh, Mike in Shenango County. Um, yeah, I'm on. I think you had a white wing I saw in the town here, right? Yeah, I didn't uh, see it, but Merlin recorded it twice in um, Milandi State Forest. And that's what county again? That's in Shenango. It's in the... Uh, the southeast corner, at town of Apton. Yeah, so I think I think there's some black spruce bogs not far from there. If I remember correctly. There's one down near Bainbridge. Oh, that's not that. And Bainbridge kind of is not far from Apton, is it? Uh, correct. Yeah. All right. I know there was some. I think it was White Wing Cross building that bog twenty something years ago. So and where's that bog? Oh man, I'd have to I'd have to dig up the the notes, but there is a black spruce pond, I believe, in Bainbridge. I'll have to dig it up. Okay. It's somewhere. Yeah, I don't know if it's gonna be easy to find, but I you know, when you saw it, was it in a Norway or heard it? Was it a Norway spruce plantation? Uh yes, but there's uh extensive um red pine up there and I don't know what else. I <laughs> There's a lot of territory, man. <laughs> yeah. You know, White Wing Crossville really won't utilize pine at all unless it's a year they're like just getting by. It does not support breeding. The, the thing I've never witnessed that clearly was witnessed in 84, 85 was White Wings utilizing Norway spruce. I did have them singing it at one time, but I don't think they messed it. I don't think they pulled it off. So it's interesting. Matter. Two more questions. Oh, sorry. Oh, this is Pam. I was just chiming in um, to add on because uh, Lance, I don't know, you guys know Lance Verderame from Sullivan County, but he birds yeah, in he, Delaware. He birds in he, Delaware he, County. He's down there, Kathy. Reading. But so he's got red cross bills in the Arctic China forest. Yeah, which is actually not that far from Afton, <laughs> considering. I know, I know Lance. Confirmed white wings, I think, breeding in one of those bogs in the Catskills a number of years ago, if you talk to Lance. But the red ones he has seen in the last week, like a few times in the, oh. in the state forest. by It's sort of near Oquaga State Forest, State Park. Gotcha. gotcha. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, male see, male see the female sitting on the nest. For sure. Andy and I were down in Arctic China today and we found red cross bills. Oh, good. Where was that? In the Arctic China State Forest. Which oh, is nice. Bill. This is <laughs> such a funny name. Were they, yeah, it is. were they singing or what were they doing? We heard some singing, yep. Yeah, and we saw others like up at the top of a tree. 
I couldn't tell you exactly which kind. We thought it was red spruce, but we're not very good tree people. Okay, so <laughs> I'll, I'll just add this. So this is the first year. So Red Cross Hill numbers have been on the increase throughout the Northeast for at least a few decades now. And this is the first time I've ever seen this Northeastern type, which we're going to describe as a new call type, breeding south of the Adirondacks. So in the state lands, another reason to record them, because I'm curious what's going to happen, is I'm getting ones in, in these Northeastern I tens we're calling now. Um, I'm getting them in the same state forest in some spots. Some spots I'm only getting one type, and I'm, I'm getting or I'm getting the other type, and so I'm getting both. So and they're actually breeding in northern Pennsylvania too right now. So it's uh, it's another call to record them if you get a get a chance to record them. Particularly in the southern part of the state, I've never seen. A Red Cross bill event in the Adirondacks like this, where it is like literally like a monoculture of the same. It's one call type. Never seen it like this. Usually there's a mishmash to some degree. There's always a dominant one. And that's almost always, it's always either this northeastern bird, or in years we get type threes that move in. Type threes can really become really common some years, but then they leave. Mostly at the end of the end of that year, they go back to the western hemlock forest in the west coast. But this year it's like all one type in the Adirondacks almost. And that one type, this northeastern bird, is also being found in the southern part of the state for the first time I've ever seen it since I started recording almost 20 years ago. So pretty cool. Any other questions? I do have to jump off for another Zoom, believe it or not, in five minutes. <laughs> I have no voice, but that's all right. <laughs> oh, I just, I answered a couple of other quick questions that people had in the chat, um, that the, the males do feed the females on the nest. Um, and then any bird that's singing, you would count as singing. Um, <sighs> Even if um, both the male and the female sing, you can still record singing for that species, for the Alice. Um, I think that was it. Oh no, there was one. So, so um, sorry, Matt, there's one other question I got. I think it was a private question. Um, so in this, for this, upcoming summer breeding period. Do you have any idea if if there any either do you have any clue if the crossbills will stick around and if they were, how would you look for them? Well usually when you have a good so you, you often have soft cone conifers like spruces and hemlocks, tamaracks will form a good cone crop one year and then the pines will alternate because pines are on a two-year cycle. Spruces, hemlocks, larches, they develop, they ripen, they drop their seed. Red pine, jack pine, pitch pine form green cones in year one. And red pine form conelets in year one. Red pine, the green cones ripen in year two. And white pine, the conelets become mature cones in year two. So because we just had a good spruce crop, there's a, and we had a we had a great pine crop last year with all those, you know, we had lots of red cross breeding in that white pine crop last year. Um, that we probably won't get a, a good spruce crop this upcoming year, but we could get another good pine crop. So we don't know yet, but uh, it's it's likely that we will not have two consecutive good breeding years, certainly for white wings. Uh, Red cross bills, there's always some red cross bill breeding in New York State, even if it's in small numbers. Um, I can find usually a few breeders, um, but not big years like this. They've been more regular big years lately for red cross bills, and that's why I think numbers are growing. They're on the increase 
uh, for Red Cross Hills. So I don't know, but the time period to look, when we look at spruces in July and August, and then see if the white pine crop is big. If the white pine crop is, they could also, the red cross bills can nest in that. White wings and reds will nest in the spruce, though. the native white and red spruce. Um, if it's a big white pine crop, sometimes if it's big enough, birds in the winter will, will breed using that white pine crop as well. So I hope that makes some sense. Again, it's kind of like spruces and hemlocks, they form a cone crop. They, they develop, they ripen, they drop their seeds. Uh, the pines are on two-year cycles, and that's often why they alternate. You know, they'll alternate from year to year. Well, people don't realize that, I mean, when I had discussions with, with one of the top, you know, researchers in North America, Red Cross, middle researchers, uh, Dr. Craig Bankman, he used to tell me that hospitals came to the Northeast to die. And I used to kind of Talk a little bit of that because you know they they clearly nest here and one of the two things that crossbills need to form residency is either a single reliable cone crop on a really reliable conifer like lodgepole pine produces one of the most reliable cone crops in the world. Um, the northeast is underrated, and the reason why this northeastern bird is really a nor more mostly a northeastern bird is the boreal forest is fairly low diversity of conifers but it has a density of conifers the western united states has a high diversity of conifers but also a high density of conifers so this all type phenomenon is really what this adaptive landscape is is out west where a lot of these cult types have formed now we do have these birds in the east because even though we might not have a high density conifer forest, the northeast has a really high diversity of conifers. If you think about it, you can stand in spots in the Adirondacks, particularly in bogs, um, and you'll have you know black spruce uh, right in the bog, red spruce rim in it, and it, it's not uncommon to have hemlock, red pine, and white pine all in proximity. So, you know, if you have an area that you have white spruce, or I mean, red spruce, black spruce, red pine, white pine, eastern hemlock, you now have an area that there's always gonna be something on the menu for a cross, for a red cross to utilize and breed. So reds are always around in my opinion. I can find reds. I mean, some years I go up and I can find them in the red pine stands in the Adirondacks and even around here uh, fairly regularly. So hopefully that makes sense. It's all about what's on the menu. It's cone ripening phenologies and holding that seed through the year so they can live to the next developing cone crop. So it's really that, that simple. I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. So anyway. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. We appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And um, have a good night. And I'll post this as soon as I can. All right. Thank you, everybody. Good luck out there. Hope you get some crossbills. Yeah, I mean, we have a contest, right? Kind of, not a contest, but a, kind of a promotional to some degree. Is that happening still? Um, or no? I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I opened that up, but good night, everybody. That's okay. Good night. Yeah. All right.